you'll stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. It's the second part of a sermon series leading up to Christmas about faith, hope, and love. And this comes in Jeremiah 31 and verse 17. God's Word tells us, the Lord tells us, there is hope for your future. Again, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us to love you and praise you. And thanks for dying for us. If someone doesn't know you here today, help them to come to know you and to realize you've already died for them. They just need to accept this gift of forgiveness of you. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat> now, just like faith, it was hard to condense that down into one sermon. Next Sunday we'll be hearing about love and that'll be even harder to get into one sermon. The Bible has a lot to say about hope. And the hope that we're talking about, I want us to understand, is a little bit different hope. You know, I used to hope when Christmas time would be coming and the, and the presents would begin to accumulate under the trees. I hope I'm getting what I asked for, <laughs> not what I deserve. But I didn't know I was going to get it. And so I had a little formula that worked pretty well when mom and dad would be gone. You would break out the tape, you would peel the paper back, and you would check it out, and you would know that what you asked for, you was going to receive. In my case, sometimes my behavior caused some of them presents to disappear, so that wasn't always a good thing. But I didn't no longer hope that I was going to get it. I knew I was going to get it. And so the hope that the Bible talks about, this hope, is not something people have told me before, I sure hope I go to heaven. I sure hope that I can make it. This hope is different. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where we looked at this, started this sermon, now faith, hope, love, abide these three, the greatest of these is love. And next week we'll have that on love. God wants us to understand these are gifts from him, and he wants us to know that we can be sure we get them. We had this verse last week in Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You can't separate faith, hope, and love and, and grace. You can't separate them. They're, they're hooked together through God's heart, and he wants us to be sure what our future holds through the cross. He wants us to know and have total reliance. Hope means I have total reliance and trust in you, God, that there will be a fulfillment of the desire that I've asked for. Webster said it's to desire with expectation of obtainment or fulfillment. It is desire fulfilled. It's an interesting verse and one I don't know that I've ever had up here. We always see about it's by grace you've been saved through faith. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 8, 24. In hope we've been saved. But hope that is seen isn't hope. For who hopes what he already sees? Who would hope for a present that he asks for if it's already, if you're asking for a new bike as a child, and the bike's already sitting there not wrapped, who, who would hope for that because it's there? What's the Bible telling us? In hope we have been saved. As we understand the gift of the cross, and that Christ already died for us. There comes a point in our life as God begins to knock at the door of our heart for the salvation message. People begin to hope that they can go to heaven. Hope in salvation means it's a desire that's been fulfilled. I know and I realize now through faith and the grace you've been given me that you're going to carry me safely to heaven. And we need to understand and have this built into our heart because this world has some tough times, tough goings for us. There are families that lose loved ones. There's heartache. There's, there's illness. There's sickness. There's, there's a lot of tragedy and things that people go through. There was a fellow by the name of Thomas. When we look at this about hoping for what he sees... There was a fellow by the name of Thomas, and we see it in John verse 20, verse 29, chapter 20, verse 29. Jesus said to Thomas, Because you've seen, you've believed. Blessed are those that haven't seen and yet have believed. We can't see Christ today. We're going to sing about him at the cantata. We've already sang about him this morning. We're going to sing about him with the kids tonight. 
But we're not going to waltz Jesus out here in physical form. And Thomas had a tough time and he wasn't going to believe unless he could poke his fingers into the nail holes and into his hand and to his side. It's a tremendous gift, hope. Well, what does hope look like if we can't see Jesus? What does hope look like and where do we find it? As a Christian, a deeper hope because my prayer is today, just like faith, that all of us are going to leave here with a stronger faith and a stronger hope. It's a simple verse in 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1, the Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. That's what this season's all about. That's the gift we want to carry through the year. That is a blessing, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's his full name. It's not like God sat up there and said, well, you know what, people down there on earth got a middle name, so I'm going to give, give my son a middle name. I have two middle names, Clarence and Lloyd. That was quite a pick. But I went with Lloyd, and if your name's Clarence, it's no offense. The Lord Jesus Christ, what's it mean to have three names? We've got to understand all three, otherwise it's hopeless. Without hope. No hope for our future aside from this person. The Lord means he is our master. He is our king. We're going to obey him in our life. Jesus means he's the sin bearer. We'll call his name Jesus. Because he's going to save these people from their sins. What about Christ? What about this last name? He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. And when we take that deeper and look at what does it really mean to be anointed, who anointed him? He's God in flesh. That's what we sing about at Christmas. Emmanuel, the Lord Jesus Christ, the master of our life, the savior of our sins, and the father come in flesh to save us through his son. And he is our hope. Now there's two things that are in contrast and we look at that people go through and struggle with in hope. Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, Delayed hope makes the heart sick, but fulfilled desire is a tree of life. Some people, pretty well convinced, and you can see by the look on their face, Christians, they're down in the heart and there is no joy in their life. And here's when happiness is going to begin, when heaven starts. That's where the abundant life is. We'll never be happy then. Christ came here to be part of our life, to walk through it. So yes, heaven's going to be different and it's going to be greater. Because there's not going to be any pain there or any suffering. And we're going to see Christ there. But if that is our only hope, when heaven starts, how are we going to be a witness? Now the opposite of that is something Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. And that's the opposite. If I don't remember the gift of what the cross has given me and through my aches and pains and the sufferings that we go through in this life, the best is yet to come. If this is the only thing that we think about in our life is our circumstances and the things we're going through and we miss the gift of heaven, we're going to be miserable then too. Well, the Bible puts this both together. Peter said it. I believe Peter had quite a walk after he denied Christ and he come to a realization of forgiveness. He said in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and won't fade away, reserved in heaven for you. If you're saved, you have a reservation, a place, a home. It's reserved. Nobody can take it from you. This living hope means he is alive. He's no longer in the grave. He's alive. And he wants to be part of our life in a thriving ministry. Well, where does hope come from once we see it's you, Jesus, but I can't see you? The psalmist says in Psalm 62, 5 through 6, Rest in God alone, my soul. It's that inward part. For my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. It comes from him. So just like the gift of faith, once we're saved, God, increase my faith. I want a stronger faith. And God looks and says, what are you going to do with it if I give it to you? 
We want to take it to other people. And God, this thing with hope, there are people that are saved that have lost hope. They've lost their sight. It's a tremendous verse that the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 6, 19 through 20, I love this because I like fishing. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul. Remember the verse before said, Rest alone in God, my soul, an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. This is an intense verse. You know, I've dropped anchors before when we've been fishing in a lot of wind. You can drop two or three of them. And if it's mud on the bottom and the wind's blowing hard enough, the boat's going to move. It's going to give way. But if it hooks on a rock, there's no amount of wind as long as the rope holds. Well, that rock that we drop our anchor on, this Lord Jesus Christ, he is the firm foundation and nothing can move him. And he wants to anchor our soul with hope. What does it mean that it enters in within the veil? Well, this Lord Jesus Christ that died, when he died and he said it's finished and he breathed his last, the veil of the temple that weighed tons and was like six inches thick was torn in two as a message to us believers that we can come into God's presence because Jesus Christ died for us and we can come straight to God and he's there to mediate at the right hand of the Father. Amen. He loves us. He cares for us. Our hope comes from him. All good things come from God, the Bible says. Our faith, grace, hope, all of it comes from God. Love comes from God. The Bible says, as this veil was torn in Hebrews 4, 16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we can receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, I'm not sitting up here and saying, well, I got this all figured out and I'm a bulletproof Christian. My hope is always 100%. My faith is always 100%. I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that. There's keys in the Bible, though, that we learn to strengthen it in this time of the year as we look at the little manger and we are reminded there was a Savior. God knew that we needed help. And he didn't leave it with just the Savior. He sent the Holy Spirit to give us that help. But we get in despair. Psalm 42, verse 5 said, Why are you in despair, O my soul, that inward part? How come you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. You understand that word, Emmanuel? That other name that was given to Christ is God with us. God wants us to know his presence. He wants to walk through us with any valley, any shadow, even death that he's there and that he loves us. Well, there had been despair that had come over one of the greatest prophets, his name was Jeremiah. God's people had been unfaithful. And the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was overrun. And his heart was just crying out to God. And they named the book of the Bible after it. And it wasn't Jeremiah. It was Lamentations. And he talked about what he had seen. Because the people, even through that, had returned to idol worship. It wasn't God's presence that they were seeking. It was beginning to break his heart. And he was losing hope. It's a long verse, but I want us to see it. It's Lamentations 3. It's several verses. 17 through 24. My soul's been rejected from peace. I've forgotten happiness. And so I say my strength's perished. And so has my hope from the Lord, remember my affliction. He's talking to himself here now. Remember my affliction and my wandering. Because he's wandering off course. The wormwood and the bitterness that I'm going through. Surely now, he says, my soul does remember. And it's bowed down within me. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. His compassions never fail. They're new every morning and great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, that inward part. Therefore I have hope in him. God's word came to him. We have God's word in our life. Psalm 119 verse 49 through 50 says, Remember the word to your servant. 
in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your word revived me. If, if we could have a bottle of pills here on the, in the foyer at the back of the church, and they were called hope pills or faith pills, we couldn't keep them filled up. It'd be like the suckers we hand out to the kids. We got to keep filling it up because they love it. Sweet. Tastes good. We take a hope pill. We have a hope pill. We have it. You know why Satan fights it so much for Christians to open it? Because he doesn't want us to have hope. He does never wants revival. He wants us to sink in depression. And God gives it to us and it's a tremendous, tremendous gift. Paul said in Romans 15 verse 4, whatever was written in earlier times was written for instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Now we just covered God's word and that gift, but he says two things. Perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures. I want us to look at that word because if both of them build hope and we come to God for hope, we need to look at both of the ingredients that bring it. Well, the Bible says in Romans 8, 25, if we hope for what we don't see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. People tell me sometimes, I can't find God anymore. I'm questioning his heart after what's happened. I don't know where he is. I can't see him. I can't find him with my heart. And I can't find him with my soul. We're going to look at the stepping stones and what part perseverance plays in it. Romans 8, 5, 3 through 5. We exult in our tribulations. That means when things go wrong. Trials. Knowing that tribulations what brings about perseverance if you want it. And perseverance brings about proven character. And proven character brings about hope. And hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God's been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit has been given to us. This gift of the Holy Spirit. You know what this is saying? God's saying, I want to help you. And it's our soul. I know I can rely on you to get me through whatever storm and whatever battle I'm going through. And God's love pours out into our hearts. How much will he pour out into our hearts? Much as we want to receive. Matter of fact, it's to where it will overflow. Now this perseverance thing, I don't like the word. Just like I don't like the word persecution in my Christian walk. I just as soon have a strong faith without it. But this part, it's the word, God's word, the encouragement of the scriptures, and perseverance. Now the Bible tells us, the second sheet isn't quite as long, so don't panic. Romans fifteen thirteen says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The the Holy Spirit is that third part of the Trinity. Jesus is going to intercede for us. The veil's ripped in two. He knows we need help here. He knows that we are weak people and we need revival. The Holy Spirit is who takes God's word, explains it to us, pours it into our heart. And God's love overflows into our heart and overflows us with hope. Sometimes I say, well... I sure don't even feel full, much less overflowing. The question God would leave us with today is, what do we want to do with the excess? What do we want to do with the overflow? Just like, what are we going to do if we want our faith increased? What do I want to do with that? Well, God, I want good things for my life. It's not just about my life. Paul so told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 9 through 10, it's a trustworthy statement Deserving full acceptance among all Christians, for it is this for we labor and strive because we fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men. You know what he wants to take this hope to, this overflow? To a lost world. That's the message of Christmas. Next Sunday when we talk about love, what are we going to do with love? 
We want to express it. We want people to know I love you, Father, and I want to love my neighbor as myself. We want to labor. We want to strive. You know, I think what we want sometimes is what people in our nation, not all, but some want. I want to, I want to get paid and not do nothing. I want hope, God, and not do nothing. There'll never be an overflow. It's all turned inward. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 6, 11 through 12. And I want this to be a message of joy for our Christmas season. We desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope. The full assurance of hope until the end. That means until Christ is coming back. So that you won't be sluggish. Now King James says it in a different word. It says so that you won't be slothful. Did you ever watch this animal called a sloth? They're going up a tree. It don't even maybe happen in a day. They're barely moving. Sometimes, whatever, what is that one animal that takes two steps forward and one back? And then, I don't know what that is. Is that, what is that, Rita? That little lizard thing. Never mind, forget about him. Let's talk about the sloth. He moves very slow. You all seen him before on National Geographic and stuff. What he's saying there. The writer's talking to Christians. Here's my desire. I want you to show this diligence. I want you to labor until Christ comes back. I want you to use this for something. Peter said in 1 Peter 1.13, Prepare your minds for action. Be sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If our hope is fixed and me looking in the mirror... You know what I see when I look in the mirror? A sinner. God wants to take me deeper into that mirror and to remember, your grace covers that. Your grace is there and it's you, Jesus, that I'm working for. It's you that saved me. It's this grace that's coming. And I want to prepare my mind for action. When our soldiers go into battle, they've got to prepare their minds. They've got to get ready. Second Thessalonians two sixteen through seventeen says, May our Lord Jesus Christ, all three words, Himself, and God our Father who has loved us, given us eternal comfort, good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Two different things. Works is us rolling up our sleeves and doing things, whether it's carrying out trash or just going over to visit our neighbor or or whatever it can mean. Good works. But what about word? And again, it's this grace that God brings to us, a remembrance of him forgiving us and loving us. Well, the word part is different than this word. Good work and word. It's a simple little verse and it was troubling one to me that Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15 Always be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you for a reason concerning the hope that's in you. Some people tell me I don't witness because I don't know God's word. Wouldn't know what, what if they asked me for a verse in the Bible or what it means and stuff and I can't find it. And I said well do the same thing I say. I can't find it right now but I'll look. I don't know every verse in here by heart. This is a different word. It can mean tied and coupled with God's word. But it's people coming to you saying, what do you found? And I began to ponder at this and I thought, how come more people ain't asking me about this? You know what the answer God gave me? The reason I'm not asked more often is because it's not very apparent, maybe. (laughs) Maybe it's not very apparent. Maybe they don't see on my face the, the joy of what it means to have a home prepared and what's coming and what forgiveness feels like. And I need to move deeper into hope for them to be able to see the words on my face. But we're to be prepared. If we don't let it overflow when the time is there and someone asks, it's going to turn inward. Now, I want to end this. 
Sometimes God kind of gives me an ending that I don't like because it's, I feel like it, it's going to make people uncomfortable. But we come to church not just for comfort. We come to church for God to talk to us and to discipline us and to be able to help us see ourselves in a different way like he sees us. God's children had gotten off course and God was going to discipline them. And we see this again in Jeremiah. There's a lot in this book. In Jeremiah 18, verse 11 through 12, we see God talking and him answering what the people are going to say. Speak to the men of Judah. He's telling this to Jeremiah. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem saying, Thus says the Lord, I'm fashioning a calamity against you. He's going to discipline him. And I'm devising a plan against you. But turn back, each of you, from his evil way and reform your ways and your deeds. But the people, now God answers. He can look into their heart and he said, But the people, they're going to say it's hopeless. Because we're going to go according to our own plans. We're going to follow our own plans. And each of us is going to act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. You know, God cannot break through that. And it holds true to us as Christians too. The whole message from Christ, deny yourself, bear your crosses daily, and follow me. You know what's wrong here in this scripture? We're going to follow our own plans. Any time any person, unbeliever or believer, says that they are going to follow their own plans, it's true, it's hopeless. Because we're not going to go to heaven, first and foremost, without Christ. Our way can never get us there. And as a Christian, we will shrivel up inside if we get off course and begin to wander and follow in our own plans. Now, he ends this, it's our last verse for today, with a positive note that he wants to speak to the people. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not calamity to give you a future and a hope. Then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me and I'll listen to you. You'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Tremendous verse. A future and a hope. God's plan for the world was to send Jesus Christ down here. Because every person that's ever lived, every person that's heart has ever beat is a sinner. And his plan was for salvation to give him a future, a home in heaven, because he sees where we're heading. He knows where we're heading. It's a place called hell. And he never wants that to happen to any person. But we can only find that as if we come to him, call upon him, and search for him. It starts with a hope. I hope I could go to heaven. A faith that's born through God bringing that into our life. And a heart changed and a life changed. I know I'm going to heaven. How I'm going to live my life here on earth and how rich it's going to be packed with hope and revival is up to me and how much I want to seek God and find that. I know he's the giver of those gifts. I know that he's the one that can increase my faith. I know he's the one that can increase my hope. I know that he's the one that can build more love into my life. He does it in various ways. But unless we seek for it, it's not going to happen. We're not going to become a thriving country ever for people to open their mailbox and a check be there for not working. I know that offends people, but that's how we treat God sometimes. Here's how I want it to work, God. You're the, you're the Santa Claus. Just give me everything. Just give me everything. Well, God, I want to seek you. I want to be with you. I don't want to be with you just so I can get stuff. I want to be with you because you're the greatest joy in my life. I shared and celebrate recovery in the room downstairs this week. I told everybody, I said, what dawned on me while we were singing was... When we get done here, God's going home with each one of us. What does that mean to me? 
What does that mean to me? How much joy does that put into my life that the Savior of this world, my God and my Creator, is going to go home with me after this church today? He's going to go home with you. That ought to fill us with hope. But God looks in our heart and sees as a Christian, how much time do I want to spend with you? How important is it to me to come to you? Not just when I need things. Father, I thank you for every person here. And I thank you that you're here and your presence in our life should mean everything to us. And it means nothing to us if we haven't met you because we don't know who you are. So if someone today hasn't met you, tomorrow may not come. You want to give them a life, a future, a future in heaven instead of hell. Because there is no future in hell. And Lord, we love you. And God, help us all to reach out and to be excited that this hope and this love can overflow to other people. It can change our lives and how we view people, how we look at the mission that you've given us in this life, and it causes revival to give birth in our life. And thank you for dying for us. Thank you, Jesus. In your great mercy, your grace, and your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, if you don't know Christ this morning, if you're here, maybe you've been in church all your life. Maybe you've heard the name Jesus since you was a little boy or a little girl. But if you don't know that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we can know. The Bible says we can know that we're going to heaven. That's why he wrote this word. If you don't know, you come. If you're not sure, or if you're sure you're not going, you come. He's died for you. If you need a church home and God's put it on your heart for this to be your church home, you come. If you just need to pray, you come. Let's stand and pray for those around you. I love you.